Welcome to Upstream. I'm Shane Morris, and I'm joined today again by my colleague, Tim Padgett, to talk more about my recent conversation on Upstream with Dr. Stephen Meyer. He's the author of an incredible book that I really enjoyed. Uh, it came out last year. It's called Return of the God Hypothesis, Three Scientific Discoveries That Are revealing the mind behind the universe. And of course, this was a re-air of one of my favorite episodes. And we did that because the current series we're running about finding God's nature in his world, seeing the signs of the creator in all aspects of reality, it needed a science section. And I could not think of a better conversation than this one to really fill that role. And many of my listeners will not have heard this one since it was, I think, episode 42 or so, and we've come a long way since then. So Tim, welcome back to Further Upstream, and I'm uh, excited for this further discussion on my conversation with Dr. Stephen Meyer. Absolutely, I, I loved the conversation, listened into it. As, as someone who's not a formal scientist and not even a, someone who has the passion for science and nature that you do, I was pleased by, t by a couple of things. One, simply, that I could follow the conversation. I mean, you're talking some deep thoughts and things like that, but you guys managed to convey these important issues in ways that I think that anyone who's basically educated could follow. Y'all did that a very good, a very good job of that. It was so I really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I think Dr. Meyer deserves most of the credit for that, simply because he is so good at explaining, breaking down these complex issues into language that the average reader, average listener, can understand. And he's you know really practiced when it comes to this book on especially the bio biology topic. That I was impressed with this book and the way he makes uh, physics and astronomy make sense. Even when he's delving into ideas like the multiverse and the implications of quantum mechanics and so forth. I mean, parts of it you do have to chew on pretty well, but he breaks it down and says, in other words, this is what the scientists, the physicists are saying. And, and it was really helpful. But, you know, this book was like a I felt like it was a, 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 a sort of magnum opus for him. I, I would be surprised if he ends up producing something that really encapsulates his work more clearly than this one does. Because his previous book, which was called Darwin's Doubt, was mainly about biology and paleontology, which is where he's focused his attention for years now. But this book brought together biology, astronomy, and physics, like I said, and the three main discoveries in those, together with a, his, a history of science and the development of the scientific method and how it's grounded in theistic assumptions. And then the whole picture come together the whole picture, when it's brought together, illustrates the fact that not only does science rely on on Christian philosophical, metaphysical ideas at the beginning, but it is increasingly turning back toward those ideas as more plausible today, at least in the implications, not quite so much in terms of public messaging yet. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that that's one of the, the fundamental things that we we miss as a society today. I remember, uh, again, one of my heroes, Francis Schaeffer, talking about the necessity of Christianity for the creation of modern science. You simply don't get modern science without Christianity. And think about it for a moment. Think the pre-Christian world, a polytheistic world, where there's a god of the waters and there's a god of the sun. And there's all these various and competing gods, some of whom created one another, some of whom were in conflict with one another, so, all these sorts of things. Uh, just this, it's chaos. There's no way to have a real science if you have this polytheistic understanding of the world. Because if the river goes where the river goes, because the river God wants to go there, you can't predict where it's going to go. You can't build a system of understanding hydrology. You can't have agriculture because you can't have irrigation because maybe one day the water will want to go somewhere else. It's only when you have a monotheistic understanding that this cosmos is the intentional creation of an intending God, a mind, as, as you guys said in your, your conversation so many times. It's only with that that can you, get, you can have a world that, that, that is systematized, a world that we can systematize. Not that we get to organize the world, but we get to organize our understanding of the world. And then increasingly, if you have an atheistic understanding, you end up with the same problem. Because not only is there no order fundamentally guiding the universe, there's nothing, there's no order to the chaos of the cosmos. It's just happening randomly. But we cannot guarantee that there is a, if there's no mind behind the universe, then we cannot expect that our minds, being made in the image of that mind, could understand it. So if what we can't know is, that, is what we're, we are observing actually real. 
Only with Christianity do you have that. Only, well, I mean, we could say monotheism uh, as kind of a fundamental category there, but specifically Christianity offers some distinct characteristics there. Yeah, and, th- and this is where Meyer gets in this book. It's a departure in many senses from the traditional intelligent design movement because the, the ID movement has emphasized this is not, we're not making religious claims here. We're making a, a purely scientific claim, which is that intelligence and the work of intelligence has certain hallmarks that we can discern through our uniform and repeated experience. This is what the work of an intelligent agent looks like. And that life, for instance, the universe, even physics and the fundamental principles that govern you know, elementary particles and the forces that hold nature together, all of these look as if, um, I forget one physicist put it, that a super intellect had monkeyed with them. At the outset, that is the sort of claim that ID has made historically. Dr. Meyer in this book brings things in a more explicit direction where he says, I think we can actually draw the conclusion that not only is there an intelligent agent involved here, but this agent has exactly the properties that the Christian or theistic God has. And so he doesn't, you know, he doesn't get into, uh, you know, one Lord God, the father created for heaven, earth and Jesus Christ, his only begotten son here. Although he is a Christian, you know, Dr. Meyer is Catholic, but he does get to the point where he says the simplest explanation for what we're seeing here abductively is an intelligence and B, the intelligence that, you know, going back to like the Kalam cosmological argument is uh, transcendent from time, space, matter and energy. You know, what what kind of thing is both transcendent and intelligent in those senses? Well, God happens to be an extremely good candidate for that. In fact, it's difficult to think of another candidate that would fit it. And so he does bring things in a theistic direction. That's why he's saying that, you know, science is is actually gesturing increasingly toward the credibility of the God hypothesis. And there's, I mean, there, there's so many things to talk about there. It's worth, I think it's worth mentioning the three assumptions, and we bring them out in the uh, interview, so I won't go into depth here, but the three assumptions you mentioned a second ago about the universe that are that Christianity makes and that are actually underpinnings of the scientific revolution. He calls it the why then, why there question. Why did science, modern science, emerge only in the Christian West? And the answer is because there are three basic assumptions about reality that Christianity makes that other worldviews do not make. Number one is that God is a free agent and he can create whatever universe he wants. And so we actually have to go out and look to see what kind of universe he created. We can't just sort of logically deduce it based on what we think ought to be the case, which is what the Greeks did. Number two is that he created us in his image, which means our minds are the kinds of entities that are capable of discerning his world accurately or thinking his thoughts after him. I think it was Copernicus who said that. And then the third was actually very impressive to me because Dr. Meyer's Catholic, but he credits the Reformation with reemphasizing this key Augustinian principle that though our minds are designed to discern God's work and think his thoughts after him, though we are in the image of God, we are fallen. We are depraved, you know, which means that we are prone to flights of fancy and self-delusion and, uh, and, you know, sort of pride and scientific politics and all these things, right? We, we come up with theories, not just because we're seeking the truth, but also because, you know, we're sinners and we want certain things to be true. And because of that, Science must be peer reviewed and constantly checked and rechecked and criticized by other scientists in order to see if, you know, you've got the, the answer right. Those three assumptions together, he says, are crucial for the modern scientific method. And if you have a view of, say, a pantheistic universe or, or a cyclical universe or one in which cause and effect are, are kind of disassociated where, you know, the gods or God behind it all could do anything at any time, right? It's not an ordered system. All of those undermine the scientific enterprise. And I don't think many people think of that, but it was, it was really cool to see those brought out. My recent conversation with Glenn Scrivener mentioned this, but his book, which is called The Air We Breathe, he goes into this, those exact same three underpinnings. And he explains them in, in very popularly accessible terms, even funny at times. So if you don't want to tackle Dr. Meyer's book, which I recommend you do, but if you can't do that right now, go pick up Glenn Scrivener's book because he'll he'll give you the same treatment of that particular point. 
Yeah, I, we have a great minds think alike moment here, or at least uh, similar minds think alike. I was about to say, I remember in your conversation with, with Scrivener, uh, it really it is that same sort of thing where our world has been so shaped by the principles of Christianity that we don't even notice them any longer. It has become so normal that we think it's the absolute norm rather than the a contingent norm based on these ideas. And it, just listen to your conversation. It's uh, in my mind, it, it's Occam's duck in the sense of t- tying together if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, et cetera, and Occam's razor. We are approaching this moment with the scientific consensus where we're creating a cause, a necessary first cause of the universe that is a mind that is has created an ordered world. The John Lennox angle about the language information, how vital that is that we're backing ourselves into a situation it's like oh no it's not christianity it's not theism it's nothing of that but there may be a mind who's in- introducing this information there may be an order and we're backing ourselves into it so it's kind of like it, it is what it is if it walks like a if it walks like a god and talks like a god well there's a chance it just might be a god behind that and i love the way they all brought out in that conversation about all that again i think that the, the popular approach is really helpful here uh, it's like the C.S. Lewis approach of we all know that C.S. Lewis read very, very deeply, but you read his stuff and a teenager can handle his ideas. Uh, and as a friend of mine said that with C.S. Lewis, he makes you feel smart because you're able to all of a sudden he talks about these ideas and there's this moment where it clicks and you're like, oh, I knew all this, but you didn't. He just helped you to understand it. So I think that was a very helpful part of the conversation. Yeah, with the principle you just invoked about you know, walking like a duck and talking like a, the Occam's razor principle or the inference to the best explanation is what my, Dr. Meyer calls it. This is really coming into play with the God hypothesis and versus the materialistic alternatives to it for explaining, particularly the origins of the universe. So you have these, what Meyer calls auxiliary theories that are just multiplying. So there's a multiplication of, uh, of theoretical causal agents that you have to pause it in order to explain the universe without recourse to a, a theistic God. And in his cases, it's just getting absurd at this point because not only are these causal agents multiplying, but if you go down those rabbit trails, it creates whole new problems for those causal agents that are designed to cause the, the cause, the effects we observe in nature that, themselves have theistic implications. And he takes this apart really nicely for the, the multiverse. It's like, well, if you have a multiverse, turns out you need a universe generating mechanism behind the multiverse uh, in order to like causally unite them all. And what, how do you get that sort of thing? And it just pushes the mystery back. And it's dressed up in, you know, physics language. And so I think a lot of Christians, a lot of readers in general will look at that and just be intimidated by it. Dr. Meyer brings it down to a really helpful level. and you know, philosophically makes the case that Occam's razor applies here, that the theism hypothesis is actually a simpler, more elegant explanation for what we see, and that science thrives on simple, elegant explanations. And that the only reason we would avoid having recourse to the theistic hypothesis is that we have some prior commitment against God. And he really brings that out, that you know, science doesn't exist to arbitrate between claims about ultimate reality, about, about you know, a deity a, a, or a, an atheistic universe. It just doesn't exist to adjudicate those points. And Richard Dawkins, in fact, is kind of the, the chief spokesman who opens up Meyer's book because, as he points out, Dawkins does not play that game, at least in one critical instance in his book, uh, River Out of Eden. He says that the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there was at bottom no purpose, no design, no good, no bad, nothing behind it all that cared about us, just blind, pitiless indifference. And in saying that, he is opening up his atheism for testing and falsification. That's a very important point to make. Because when you, the moment you say that, you imply that it is at least possible that we would observe a universe that does not have those properties, that instead has the properties that we would expect if there was a designer, right? And and Dr. Meyer says, challenge accepted. You know, I take you up on that uh, on that challenge, Dr. Dawkins, and, and let's let's look 
and see if it's true that the universe has those properties uh, that you would expect if it was purposeless and if blind, pitiless indifference was all there is, or if it has properties we would expect if there was actually someone behind it. And you know, I think his case is extremely persuasive that we do. It, it does look that way. It does look like a designer put it in place. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's almost like the uh, internet meme that we've talked about uh, often at the Colson Center of congratulations, you've invented marriage. Well, it's congratulations, you've invented God. Right. You've invented <laughs> Christianity. Have you read Contact, the Carl Sagan? There was the movie with Jodie Foster. No, I, I think I saw the movie, but I didn't. I, I didn't read the the novel. I, I've yet to dive into Sagan fiction. That's that sounds like a fascinating little subgenre. I would say it's it's worth uh, reading for a couple things. One, he's actually a decent writer. It's a, it's a good story. The uh, the other thing is uh, one other thing is the Matthew Bicconi character in the book. Sorry, in the movie, he's kind of this broadly uh, a progressive Christian. He didn't want to get tied down by he it talks about how he goes and does some secular relief work in third well, third world or whatever we called it at the time. Uh, and so he's not one of those guys who's only gonna work through the church. He works through the secular arms, so he's not biased. And he goes and he sleeps with a Jodie Foster character, so I mean he's clearly not all that keen on Christian morality. In the book, however, he is um, he's a fundy. Uh, it talks about him as rarely leaving his native rural south. He is a uh like a six you know, young earth creationist, the whole shebang, but he still retains that he's a sympathetic character, which is not what you'd expect for someone like that in a Carl Sagan story. That part's interesting. Another part's interesting is that a repeated theme in all of kind of Sagan lore is he's looking for the proof. What's where's the proof of the existence of God? And spoiler alert: at the end of the book, they find the proof. Part of the story, the Jodie Foster character teases out Pi, like. 3.14, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And she finds a pattern. Yeah. And, and, and I'm not a math guy, but Pi, Pi is famous for not having repetition, right? There's no, there's no pattern. Right. Well, yeah, exactly. And they find a pattern uh, implicitly saying, yeah, here's basically that's the sort of proof he'd be looking for. And it is interesting that when we take kind of the, the, the Linux and the John Linux angle and the stuff that Meyer here is talking about, we kind of are finding that pattern in Pi. And so it is interesting that we have that moment uh, of create, uh, not creating, but discovering the proof, th- discovering the fingerprints of God in the evidence. And that is a fascinating thing. Well, one thing with all this that uh, I, I found interesting, and I think I, I emailed you about this, that um, when Meyer talked about his uh, Wikipedia uh, page getting scrubbed, or was it deleted, right? It was deleted? I think it was deleted, yeah, for, for a brief time. And then it was edited to uh, you make it clear that he's a pseudoscientific quack. Right. And I found that so very fascinating. And it just, it's this Animal Farm moment. You probably read Animal Farm, but anyone who hasn't read Animal Farm, it's a parable of, of, yeah, a parable of the communist revolutions and whatnot. And you have this instance where the pigs are the leaders of the animal farm. They overthrow the evil, you know, autocracy of the, the, the farmer. But by the end of the book, they literally begin to look more and more like human to the point where you can't tell the difference between the pigs and the earlier masters. And there is this strange mythical el- kind of element of our current temporary situation where what is the Neil deGrasse Tyson mythology? Let's call it a mythology. His mythology of the discovery of science is that these arcane, obscure priests were holding all the knowledge and keeping people from thinking, thinking freely and anything like that. And they're there with their black robes and they're stealing the knowledge from the people because they want to maintain their power. But these heroes come along and they, challenge what's going on, and they bring the light. And we've talked about this sort of thing before. But now we have this irony that people like Stephen Meyer, they were cool so long as they weren't heretics. That is, they were cool with uh, in the popular science mode so long as they didn't rock the boat, didn't challenge any assumptions, didn't say that there's something that science with a capital S can't uh, explain. But now once he crossed that line, he's I think he said he's been called a theologian, which I'm not sure how to take that, that that scene is an insult, given that that's my job. But the fact that he, he's not even given credit for being a scientist, because he is a legit scientist. You can disagree with his conclusions, but he's a legit scientist. But he's been cast out of the, out of the, the ranks of the faithful. I, I'd like to hear your response on that kind of thing, how we kind of create this moment where you know, the black robes of the old clerics are now replaced by the white lab coats of capital, uh, capital S science. Well, if you if you actually look at the history of science, there are these moments where an established consensus 
a body of sort of established experts uh, outright persecutes or at least tries to discredit a rising crop of revolutionary thinkers who are challenging the existing consensus. And you see, you know, you see this with the, the Copernican revolution, probably the most dramatic example, but Dr. Meyer details another much more recent revolution that we don't normally think about. And that is the revolution from a, a steady state model of the universe or, or perhaps oscillation to uh, the big bang cosmology. And it, we think we take the big bang, you know, so for granted that fa in fact, many, when many Christians hear it, they're just like, Oh yeah, you know, the big bang, that's the alternative to creation. Well, not really, because the Big Bang is this acknowledgement by physics and astronomy that the universe had a beginning. You know, that seems pretty, pretty standard milk toast stuff nowadays. But a hundred years ago, it was not. In fact, the steady state model prevailed that, that the universe has always existed. And it took a number of, of key astronomers and uh, mathematicians like Einstein and you know, cosmologist to come up. In fact, well, Einstein, of course, resisted this. I should note that he resisted it at first. Eventually, he uh, succumbed to the proof and, and helped calculate exactly what was going on. But it took a number of key figures to overturn the existing consensus. And Dr. Meyer documents some of the, the vitriol and some of the scientific snobbery that was thrown around at these revolutionaries who wanted to challenge the steady state model. And it mirrors in, in so many ways what we see happen again and again over the course of scientific history, where, where a new model is proposed, the, the proponents of the old model who are deeply invested in it try to not only argue against the new model, but to discredit those who are proposing it. And this is that human nature that we talked about earlier coming into play. This is the, the third underpinning of science, that we are humans, even if we have a, a lab coat and a degree from a top scientific institution, and even if we've got a lot of peer-reviewed articles, we are still human. And we have pride. We have arrogance. We have investment in our, our own ideas. We have a fear that our life's work will be flushed down the drain because our ideas have been challenged and overturned. And all of that plays into our motivation. So we're not impartial. And that means that there's these kinds of conflicts are inevitable. What we should do in response, I think, is is be very careful not to succumb to these games where we define certain inquiries out of court from the beginning. We say, this is not allowed. A God hypothesis is simply not allowed because it's unscientific. Well, says who? I mean, what, what, what are the boundaries of science and who, and who said that atheism was a precondition for practicing science? If the universe was indeed created by a God, how would we know it? How would you detect that? The entire contention of the intelligent design movement is that it is detectable, which is, you know, a tenet of Christianity going back to the beginnings of, of modern science, uh, all of whom, by the way, the founders of modern science believe that they were thinking God's thoughts after him. That's part of the, the mythology that has to be overturned, the Neil deGrasse Tyson cosmos mythology that, that scientists came along and and wrested knowledge from the jaws of repressive and obscurantist church. No, that's not what happened at all. The church was the sponsor of the scientific enterprise. And, you know, many of the key myths you think you know, like the Galileo affair, turn out not to be nearly as clear cut as, as you imagine. In fact, it turns out, and this is something that Scrivener goes into, turns out that in the Galileo affair, the church, the Catholic church was actually siding with the scientific consensus of the day against a guy who was seen as a quack. And by the way, whose calculations turned out to be wrong. <laughs> the only thing Galileo was right about was the fact that the earth goes around the sun. He was not right in his reasoning that got him there. It took Kepler to come along and correct his calculations and say, no, here's it. They have elliptical orbits and, and everything. Galileo's calculations are wrong. His conclusions are right. His calculations are wrong. That complicated story needs to be retold. And I think not just because we having a good, accurate view of history is, is helpful and important, but because that history informs where we are now. And it helps us to recognize the cries for repression of heretics scientifically for what they are. They're that old human impulse coming up and saying, no, 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 we have an established theory. It's settled science. It's over. We're done. The theory is, you know, is a law now until someone comes along and proves that the earth goes round the sun.
until someone comes along and proves that the universe had a beginning. And then we have to reconsider things. And that's, I think, what's happening here. And it's it's worth noting that, as Meyer points out, most of the challenges to the ideas he's proposing are not scientific challenges. They're challenges on the level of boundary drawing. They're philosophical challenges. They are just assertions that we cannot invoke supernatural causes to explain natural phenomena. And the first thing to say to that is, well, why not? Says who? Who died and made you the king of science, <laughs> right? We're just trying to get to the truth. Why, why, why are you drawing the boundary there? And the second thing to say that it, with that is scientists today don't follow that rule because by definition, some of the hypotheses they're proposing to explain the universe are supernatural. They are over and above, behind or before the nature we can actually observe. And as such, they're untestable. Sounds an awful lot like a god, except it's extremely inelegant, <laughs> unlike the theistic hypothesis. It's very fideistic. It's, I mean, you, when you talk about like the whole multi, multi-universe sort of thing, which has become such a trope in many things. And you, you can see the logic of how it appeals to the current mentality. Because if we have this whole, what's the word, anthropic principle, that the world is so finely tuned to where we are, they've so precisely, how do they explain that? Well, the way you explain that our world is so precisely finely tuned is that there are an infinite number of equally large universes where every single possible permutation has happened we just happen to be in one of the ones that is in it. And you, you see this all across pop culture uh, science, sort of the, like science fiction. Actually, I've, I've used that example recently. I, I'm here in my hometown of Nashville. And if you know anything about Nashville the last, say, 10, 15 years, it has really grown up, basically doubled in size. And I've used that image with my friends saying that I think I would get lost less in my own hometown if I were in a completely different town because it's almost right. I could use that image that it's like it's like my hometown, but not, right? And you see that image in all sorts of popular culture things where someone gets into a parallel universe and like everything's same except for so-and-so is married or so everything's the same except the Russians win the Cold War or something like that. Except for uh, except for Spider-Man got together with Gwen Stacy instead of Mary Jane. Exactly. Yeah, uh, you have that. And it's very appealing because all of a sudden uh, it's an escape clause where the materialist doesn't have to explain why our universe is so fine-tuned. It isn't. We just happen to be one that is, but there's all these others. And I was, I was love the fact that you guys brought up that point, but that this doesn't actually solve the problem. Two things. One, it simply removes the problem one step back. It also, like the, the late Ptolemaic understandings of the orbits of the planets, it makes it more complicated. There's more to explain. And again, the top, if you if you remember your science, I know you do, but for our audience who doesn't remember their high school science or college science, wherever we heard this, if you look at the um, the late medieval, early modern era, is they're just they're analyzing the orbits of the planets as they were holding on to this Ptolemaic, referring to Ptolemy from the fourth century, or whatever. That their understanding of how the planets worked it was supposed to be a perfect circle because that's how things go. They yielded on that because they began to notice that there are these little Mars began to look like it went back and forward in its orbits. And in order to explain it, they came up with these little loop-de-loops that the, the Mars would do in its orbit around the Earth. The simpler explanation was that the Earth also orbits and we were passing Mars. And that's why it looked like it backed up and things like that. And so you see so much of this. It, it, this What we're seeing in this multiverse is an attempt to explain away a very a big problem. And it, it actually doesn't. It actually creates more. And it, it is an interesting echo of that past time. Yeah, that's the multiplication of auxiliary hypotheses that he refers to. And those who haven't followed the, the sort of developments in physics and the cosmological origins debate, this will be, you know, sort of opaque on the surface. But I think Meyer really helps, helps drill down and show how desperate many of these attempts are and how they simply do not solve things. The, the multiverse in particular, you know, it's so permeating and, you know, it, it's, it permeates pop culture at this point. It's in every, Mar I think every Marvel movie is now about the multiverse. So we have these pop culture perceptions of it, but, but there, there really is a obsession with the idea that multiple universes exist because of certain paradoxes in quantum physics. And then because we need them as an auxiliary hypothesis to explain the anthropic principle, to explain why the properties of our universe are finely tuned 
to a degree that makes it possible for life to exist. And, and that, that seems very improbable. Well, if you posit an infinite number of other universes, I suppose it seems like it makes more sense that there would be one in which life would be possible, at least. The problem is, as Dr. Meyer points out, with even that assertion is that these universes are causally disconnected. So no matter how many other universes exist, it does not change the probability against our universe having the properties that it does that make life possible, even on like a subatomic level, you know, even on a level that, that makes it possible for things like carbon to form, for there to not to be a universe that's just purely made up of hydrogen and helium, you know, that's not going to support any life. And, and that's just, that's just one point. You know, he gets much deeper into the criticism of the whole multiverse hypothesis and why it, it you now need an explanation for the explanation. It just multiplies causal agents when instead it is actually much easier and more elegant to say, okay, theism proposes a cause that that makes sense in light of all of the evidence we see. The question is, why is that off the table? Why is a God off the table. And I, I mean, I think the simplest answer getting down to a worldview level of dealing with human motivations here, Tim, is that a multiverse and a universe generating mechanism at the back of everything does not impose moral accountability on us. It doesn't expect anything of us. It doesn't desire to have a relationship with us. And it doesn't tell us who we can and can't sleep with. I mean, it really does come down to some simple, simple moral accountability like that. And the fact that we are in rebellion against God. And, you know, not to get too preachy, but it is folly to forget that scientists are humans and that they're fallen humans. I'm not saying that, you know, all scientists who reject God or who do science as if he doesn't exist are just fudging the data or something. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that our perceptions are influenced in ways that we don't even fully understand by our what we desire to be true. And even Albert Einstein did this. And this is what, you know, Meyer documents and many other books have documented was what Einstein called the greatest mistake of his career when he jury rigged the cosmological constant to make it seem as if there was a force that perfectly balanced out gravity without implying that the universe was expanding. Because if the universe is expanding, that implies it had a beginning because there would have been a point in the past where it came together in a big, you know, like a big crunch. Reverse that and you have a big bang. That's what he didn't want to be the case because he didn't like the idea of there being a beginning because it had strongly theistic implications. And many others felt that way. And he said, you know, I, I was blind. I was blind to what I was doing on my chalkboard in my equations because I wanted something to be true so badly. If Albert Einstein can trick himself, you can too. <laughs> it's nobody's, nobody's above that sort of uh, self-deception. Yeah, I mean, like that we, we often critique postmodernism, but one of the, one of the good critiques that postmodernism has for modernism is that we don't simply believe that things are true. We want things to be true. There is that personal element, uh, that comes into play in how we perceive, how we arrange, how we prioritize incoming data. And again, the postmodernists are wrong about all sorts of things, but they get that. They get that there's this personal element going on there. Yeah. Well, Tim, I, this has been a great conversation. Were there any other thoughts that you had? I mean, this is, it's such a huge subject and there's so much to discuss. And I, I think we could go on all day on this, but uh, I want to give you the, the mic for our closing here. Sure. I mean, I, I think that just w one quick thought that uh, was a bit of a question or um, and I don't know if you want to answer it now, or maybe I can just give some thoughts. Something I noted that uh, towards the end when he was, when Meyer was talking about his endorsements for the book and something that, that struck me was that he noted that he was surprised happily surprised that many of the endorsements were coming in from people like the big wigs of science. They might not agree with his ideas, but they tracked with where he was going with it. They understood as opposed to the Wikipedia crowd who ran him in the mud, you know, called him all sorts of dirty names like theologian. There is this disconnect between genuine science and popular science between People who are doing the actual work of science, which goes to your point that people aren't fudging the data, they're maybe affected by the perceptions, but they're not dishonest per se. But the hardworking people of science who are making these discoveries, they're much more able to track with conversations like this than the more popularizers of science. And I know that Carl Sagan and Neil uh, deGrasse Tyson and all these other guys, they're legit scientists when they're talking in their field. 
uh, when they begin to make that a le- a leap to talking to the popular culture, that, that's where they begin to fudge the data. I don't know if it's an ego thing or a whatever else thing, but that's where problems begin to come in. And just I, I wonder what hope we have in that. Is there a, a wedge issue, you might say, for theists, for Christians to have these conversations with legit scientists who aren't talking to the popular level to engage with them in a way to kind of help to foment our own Copernican revolution, uh, a theistic revolution of the 21st century? I just wonder what your thoughts on that. Yeah, there's a serious disconnect, you're right, between the popularizers and the actual practicing, published, peer-reviewed scientists who are, who are, who are actually doing research in the present. The, my favorite example, this is probably Richard Dawkins. And I've talked to a number of uh, you know, keen observers of current evolutionary biology and you know, people actually in the field. And one of the things they pointed out is that Richard Dawkins is at least three decades behind the times. Because at some point in his career, though he is a, you know, an Oxford educated biologist, at some point in his career, he made the choice to leave the research track and enter the popularizer track. And because of that, he got stuck in the neo-Darwinian synthesis of 30, 40 years ago and never moved beyond it. So he, he is actively promoting ideas and has been for a very long time now as one of the lead new atheists that are you know, desperately out of date, making statements that are just not defensible, even in mainstream evolutionary biology. And, and that's, that's the sort of thing you see in a lot of different fields. I think there's a gradient among the sciences, among the, the different disciplines, where there's an openness to theism more so in some than in others. So I, I would say probably biology is one of those where you do, you do see a lot less openness to theism, whereas physics, you know, I've, I've kind of discovered physicists are extremely open to metaphysical speculation, theological speculation, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and quite a few of them are theists. I mean, even back in his day, C.S. Lewis noted this where he said uh, in the screw tape letters, don't let your sci- your uh, patient dive into science and, and start um, studying that too much. Cause it's not, you know, you, you might want to undermine his faith, but, but you might do exactly the opposite. You might reinforce his faith and get him to think about concrete realities, which is not what we wanted him to do. There have been sad cases among the modern physicists, he says. <laughs> and I, and I think that's absolutely true. We see a headline every so often of exactly that happening where a physicist says, you know what? I have decided I'm a theist now. Or, or I'm a Christian now. And that's, it, it's the implication of exactly the sorts of discoveries we're talking about here. So I do think there is a disconnect. On the other side, you know, there is the reality of institutionalization. And the, the Guardian article we talked about on Breakpoint recently that, that was calling for a new theory of evolution and challenging the existing theory, the existing synthesis based on all of these new discoveries and some old discoveries that have been suppressed for a while. And they said that one of, one of the chief scientists, I think he was a head of a, of a department, a science department in, uh, in Europe. I have to go back and look at who it was. But, but he said something to the effect of the reason all of this is being so suppressed is because we have whole departments and, and endowed chairs and tenured professors and, and lots and lots of money in publishing that, that all comes back to this neo-Darwinian synthesis. He, he said, it's a whole industry. And that's the reason you see some of the resistance you do to challenges. So I'm not, I'm not sort of whitewashing practicing research scientists who are in saying, well, they're, they're open to theism, but it's just these crazy popularizers who, who are telling a different story. No, that's not entirely true either. But I do think, and I had a, a conver- another conversation recently on that upstream that made this clear, that scientists, real scientists who are actually actively involved in their discipline, have a much greater tendency to be cautious about these things than the public face of science does. And as a general rule, the more public the figure and the less research he or she has done in, uh, in recent decades, the more strident they'll be about these kinds of issues. The example par excellence is a guy who has never, never done any research, never been a, an active scientist in his life, Bill Nye, who has a bachelor's degree in engineering, I think. So, you know, it's this sort of, this sort of thing is observable. It holds true. But I think that Dr. Meyer is aware uh, and sober about the resistance that he and other theists face in making this case. It is still an uphill battle, even in 
among real scientists in the academy. And that's, uh, that's the, the work remains to be done. But he seems to be very hopeful that the, the tide is turning and the case is easier to make now than it has been for some time. And that's why I really appreciated his book and our conversation. Well, thanks, Tim, for joining me. This was a good conversation. Again, we'll be back next week to talk more about uh, the next episode. We should have a new episode for you next week. But I encourage you also to uh, pick up Dr. Meyer's book. It's a long read, but I won't quite call it a dense read. I think if you if you go through it slowly, which is what I did, and you sort of carefully pick apart and digest everything that he's that the ideas he's giving to you, he brings it down to a level that is very much accessible to the average reader. And I think you'll come away with not only a, a greater sense that science is in harmony with faith, but also a greater understanding of how science itself works and the questions that are at the back of the whole enterprise. And that's that in itself is enriching. So Tim, thanks for joining me. I'll see you next week. Sure thing. Thank you very much. 